Hello, and thank you for coming back to the fourth of four sessions on how the Holy Spirit works in your life, living with the Spirit. In this particular situation, we are going to drill down in a number of um, items for you. So let me bring up the screen in which we will share. And here we go. Uh, along with me, uh, once again, I'm introducing Dr. Arden Gilmer as our expert, and he's going to walk us through today's session. I'm not seeing full stream. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> as Dana said, we welcome you. And uh, throughout the, the sessions of the Holy Spirit, we've had a theme verse and uh, actually two verses that come, come from Paul's letter to the Galatians chapters, chapter 5, verses 16 and 25, uh, where Paul says, uh, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. So there's the contrast that's there and we'll see that uh, later in today's uh, session as well. And then later in that same chapter, he says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Uh, sometimes we struggle with the practicality of this, with the how question, how do we do this? The uh, picture that we've used throughout of a three-legged race, uh, to me, illustrates this. The middle person would be the Holy, would represent the Holy Spirit, and the other two need to... Uh, and not compete with what he's doing or she's doing, but uh, need to cooperate with that and uh, get in sync with the one who is uh, leading uh, the, the cadence there. So uh, that's a picture that we need to get in sync and be in sync with the Holy Spirit uh, as we seek to live our lives day by day by day. Uh, the New Testament does use the term walk many times to uh, signify this uh, continual living with the Lord, continual living with the Spirit, uh, being very conscious on a daily basis of his presence in our lives and desiring to be discerning of what he is saying to us and uh, obedient to what he is doing in us. Uh, all of that is uh, about, about walking in the Spirit, and our entire sessions have been called Living in the Spirit. And uh, this is what we're uh, continuing to uh, hope for ourselves and for uh, those of you who will hear this. So it reminds me of what we talked about two sessions ago, where we said being mindful of being moment by moment with the spirit, connecting, right. connecting the spirit to us and us to the spirit. Yes. Intimate relationship. Mm -hmm. And that's the perfect way to sum up what this relationship is like. That's, that's the how. Mm -hmm. It's a moment by moment. Okay, this particular slide tells us that uh, there's some keys in this. And your responsibility is to go find which ones as we go through this are ones that uh, we're saying are key keepers, which means these are ones you might want to take a picture of or you might want to request that slide from us so that you can have that for future use. Now, in review, the first session, if you want to go find that, and where you find that is on um, BFC Sebring on Facebook. I think YouTube. I'm sorry. I was just thinking about that. YouTube, not <laughs> Facebook. Uh, so once again, BFC Sebring on Facebook. And all, all three topics that we've had in our workshops are there. But this particular topic on the spirit will be some of the last ones that are, are being posted. So the first session we had is who is the Holy Spirit that created a foundation for us to build on. And we talked about the relationship of the Trinity with that and uh, some other great insights that came from it. The second session had to do with tire hitting the road, that moment by moment piece being mindful. And that's how do I allow this Holy Spirit? How do I give the spirit permission to work in my life. That's what we define as walking. Last session, we talked about the gifts. What are your gifts? And we gave you six different uh, methods to find out what your gift is. If you're interested in that, go find it. And we'll talk it through with you. There's no magic formula. 
And um, but what it, we posted on that particular thing will be great benefit for you in your search of your gift and or your gifts. Finally, today, we are going to talk about how do I demonstrate the fruit of the spirit in my life? And there it is. All right, as we uh, talk about the fruit of the Spirit, one of the key passages for us are words from Jesus himself uh, in the upper room with his disciples on the night he was betrayed um, in the upper room discourse. And uh, particularly in John uh, 15, he talks about the relationship between the vine and the branches. We'll uh, delve into that a little bit. And then the relationship between the branches and the fruit. And then what is his role? That's Jesus' role in all of this. And we have a role in it as too, and as well. So what we'll, uh, we'll look at our role in this, uh, in this branches and fruit uh, relationship. And then we'll do, uh, after we do that, we will move to Paul's passage in Galatians 5, where he talks about the fruit of the spirit, uh, what they are, and itemizes some of them, and uh, how they make us, help us to look like God love like God. And we're going to share with you how to apply those. So the first question in this process is, what is the relationship between the vine and the branches, Arden? Okay, we uh, go to John chapter 15 for 17 verses for that. And uh, Jesus uses some uh, key words here. And at this particular point, uh, we'd like for you to have a pencil and paper handy and uh, as we uh, go through this passage, uh, put a little dash mark every time you hear the word cut or prune, or the, and the same with remain or abide, and uh, uh, likewise with the word love. How many times are each of these words used in this passage? And then uh, what action does this uh, passage require from us? We want we'll to look at that, that as well. We'll talk about that at the end. Um, you may want, you may choose to go get your Bible. However, we will be posting this so you can read along with us in the version we're using and or use your own Bible. So pause this real quick right now and go get your paper and pen and your Bible and we'll be ready to go. And once again, remember, you're going to be numbering, finding out how many times each one of these areas come up in the Bible. All right, the uh, dynamic passage before us is, as I mentioned, from John chapter 15. Uh, Jesus is talking with his disciples, and he uses the uh, grapevine and fruit imagery that they would be very, very familiar with. There were vineyards all around uh, Jerusalem and vineyards all around through uh, the Holy Land, and so they would be very, very aware of that. But Jesus takes that to make an application for their relationship with him and he with them. So I will uh, read the, this passage uh, fairly slowly and so that you can count uh, as we go along. Uh, Jesus said, I am the true gra grapevine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't bear fruit and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything that you want, and it will be granted. 
When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, and your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the father told me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command. Love each other. All right. So you probably had to hustle pretty quickly to find all the cuts or prunes, all the remains or abides, and all the love. There are quite a few there. So take a moment and tally that, and we're going to reveal to you how many times we figured it out. And depending on your version of the Bible that you have, uh, you might be plus or minus of what we have when we tally them. So cutting and proving, how many times did that come up? We found three. Remaining or abiding, how many times did that come up? We had 10, a whole lot of those. And then the ultimate love. How many times did that show up? Well, you saw at the end of the scripture that it was quite a few times, and that one was eight. So what's the required action that we read from this, Arden? Well, the required action is that we uh, have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And uh, that's that's the, uh, the abide part, the remain part. And when we have that, then there's going to be some fruit that comes out of that, uh, namely love. Love is the big, is the root of the relationship we have with the Lord. And it's also the expression of that relationship through us and in us and through us. Now, notice the vine that you see in the lower right hand corner. Do you see anything detached? No, because the illustration here means that if you want to participate in the love of God, you need to be attached to that vine in order to get that. If you want to produce fruit, you need to be able to be attached to that vine to produce that. Okay, so next step. What is the relationship between the branches and the fruit? Well, here's where the abiding comes in. The abiding relationship, uh, newer translations call it remain. Um, It literally means to move in with Jesus, and Jesus moves in with you. So it's talking about that organic, intimate relationship with Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Uh, Jesus said, abide in me. He's making this very, very personal. Um, last week, we, we saw how <clears throat> Jesus said, I'm sending you one just like me, the comforter. And so we, through the Holy Spirit, we are also abiding in Jesus. And then Jesus adds more to this. How do we abide in him? Well, we abide in him by abiding in his word. Um, Jesus himself is the word, John says. But Jesus, the, who is the word, also spoke words to us. And those are found in scripture, of course, and we need to um, spend time with the scriptures and allow them to penetrate and saturate into our spirit and into our hearts and then abide in love. Again, we saw that that's just a crucial thing, and that's going to continue to come up in our in our presentation even today uh, that we are to abide in his in his love. And then, as I said, Jesus said, 
remain in me, abide in me, and I in you. Uh, move in with Jesus, and Jesus moves in with you. There's a man named Bob Munger, who uh, several years ago now wrote a little pamphlet booklet uh, called uh, My Heart, Christ Home. And uh, what he does in that booklet is he, he visualizes Jesus coming into our life as though it's our house, our home. And as he walks through each room in our house, uh, like, well, the porch, like the living room, like the dining room, like the kitchen, uh, like the bedroom. Uh, he draws spiritual application out of that uh, for us that uh, really Christ moves into our intimately into our hearts and into our lives. If you'd like a copy of that book, uh, email us and we'd be happy to send you one. And also in that particular story, which is phenomenal, Jesus goes to a closet and the closet is full of, well, you probably have one at home full of stuff. Stuff that you probably need to get rid of. And he uses that as an illustration of there's sin in your life and we're hiding it in a closet. When in doubt, shove it in the closet, right? Especially if company's coming over, shove it in the closet. Well, Jesus comes over and so we shove our sins in a closet and he opens up that closet door and says, we need to clean your house. So get that book. It's phenomenal. The other thing I'd like to support Arden's teaching here with is, is that the word can be defined in at least three different ways. You have the word, meaning the person of Jesus, like in John 1, 1. Then you have the word that is Jesus' words that come out and things that he speaks. But often in churches, you will hear the word, and that is the thousands of words called the Bible. And so when somebody says the word, they're saying scripture or Bible. So those are three different ways that when you see the word, you have to decide, is it one, two, or three? Okay? Ready okay. to move on. So he's got a role. I got a role. Help me understand those. All right. Uh, Jesus is the one who is uh, actually paramount and primary here. He does what we can never do. He produces the fruit. Um, and uh, if you can visualize a, a grapevine, uh, the, the, the root and the stem comes up and then the branches uh, bear the fruit. But if the branch, as Jesus said, is separated from the vine, it becomes worthless. It can't bear any fruit in doing that way. So the relationship with Jesus is absolutely essential, is absolutely key. And that relationship needs to be um, <laughs> fertilized like a grape vine would be fertilized. Um, that relationship needs to be uh, honored. That relationship needs for us to just be open to it as deeply as we possibly can and allow the, the spirit of Jesus to move through us. So it's Jesus who produces the fruit. We are the branches. And so that's where the fruit uh, is made visible. Um, that's our, that's our role. And we can only fulfill that role as we are uh, equipped with, with uh, by Jesus and filled with his spirit and filled with his life. And even as we do this, we ourselves experience the presence of Jesus Christ in our lives. And then uh, we are also then to uh, share the fruit through our lives in our relationships in the, that we have in the, in the world through in, a, in our life. So uh, this is that just that very crucial organic relationship that we as uh, the branches have with Jesus and the result is the fruit. So now we're going into the second part of what we want to share with you and that's specific fruit. We're going to define it and apply it. So first step is what are the fruit and then how do I use that fruit? So this shows you a picture of that fruit and these are brief explanations of them. And then Arden's going to take us through a deep dive of this so that we can get a clear understanding of these. So first one and foremost one and most important one is love. And here's a definition that says our responsibility is to seek the highest good of other people. And there's joy. This is a joy that's focused vertically with God. And that's a gladness that's not based on the circumstances, which is your horizontal piece. 
And when you focus on the joy comes when you're focusing this way, regardless of your circumstances. Peace also comes as a result of that. Uh, it's not a peace as the world thinks of peace. It's a peace because of that relationship, regardless of the circumstances. And that's contentment and unity between people. Then comes patience. Wouldn't you just kind of like to take this one off that list? Sorry, it's there and it's going to stay there. But this is one that uh, is important because we need to be slow to speak and slow to anger. Understand the situation before we react or respond. Then there's kindness. Kindness does tremendous things in, in mending and blending and bringing relationships to a personal situation. This is where you show mercy and tenderness to the people around you, regardless of uh, how difficult some of those situations can be. And then there's goodness. This just means you have an open heart and you're a generous person. And that, that helps other people love you back. There's faithfulness. That's being dependable and loyal and full of trust. So I can trust you if you are being faithful by being dependable and loyal. And then there's this gentleness piece. A lot of times that can go with the goodness and the kindness, but it's one of those situations where you are not better than that other person. You are humble, but yet you are made in the image of God. So it's not like you need to be stepped on, but you have a calmness about you. You come across as a non-threatening person. We don't need to be right all the time. We need to love all the time. And as a result of loving, the door will be open for us to share our thoughts and our cares for pe people. Finally, there's self-control. And this is just doing what is right, being righteous and behaving well. So let's take this down to, oh, that's a key keeper for you. So that's a good one. Hopefully you picked up on already that it's worth a picture. We're gonna have this several other times for you. But we're going to flip the coin here, and Aaron's going to share what it's not. One of the ways the Bible teaches truth is by contrast. And uh, Paul does that very vividly here in uh, these verses. Uh, he outlines and gives and presents the fruit of the Spirit. But uh, he precedes the, those words with these. Uh, he was writing to people that came out of a very pagan, uh, immoral society. And uh, he's presenting to them an entirely different uh, viewpoint about uh, life. And uh, he's drawn this vivid contrast. So he writes very forthrightly to them. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. So he's talking about the sinful nature here. as It expresses itself through sexual immorality, through impurity, through lustful pleasures, through idolatry through sorcery and hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Um, he says, uh -huh. "I let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life, very strong words now, will not inherit the kingdom of of God. As you read Paul's uh, various letters in the New Testament, quite frequently as he uh, makes his makes talks about life in Christ, he draws this contrast. You'll find this list of uh, sins in some of the others of Paul's writings as well. So he's making a really strong, vivid break here of lifestyle, um, but lifestyle that grows out of a completely uh, pagan spirit and Paul says there's just no room in that, uh, in the Christian life for that. And so it's a contrast with the fruit of the Spirit that he makes here. The list that you see there is not inclusive. It is not, well, if you can clear these up, then you're living a good life. That's not the truth here. And the other lists that you find in Paul's writings uh, are not identical to this, but they're um, complementary to each other. If you are able to handle all of those, even then, you're not good enough to get into the kingdom of God because Christ is the only way, the truth and life to get to heaven. It's not your works. It's what he has done on behalf for you to forgive you of all these things that we can do wrong, forgive you of all these sins. And in this situation, uh, the best way to understand whether you have a sin going on is allow the Holy Spirit to convict you 
to confront you and to say, you need to, um, First John 1, 9, confess a sin and God will be faithful and just to forgive you of that sin and cleanse you from anything you've done wrong. Here, Paul talks about it being a sinful nature, the sinful nature. And when we receive Christ as our Savior and Lord, we receive a new nature. We receive his nature. And so uh, the fruit of the Spirit comes out of this new nature that we have being born again, born from above, as Jesus said to Nicodemus, uh, born by the Spirit. We receive a new nature. So if this conversation is a bit confusing to you, which it can be, allow us to encourage you to, again, write us and say, help me understand this thing where it's not by me, but through Jesus that I can get to heaven. And we'll give you a solid answer based on scripture. Uh, okay. Sometimes people raise the question, well, what's the difference between the gifts and the fruit? Um, in a sense, they're not that different because they both are sourced by the Holy Spirit. He's the one who distributes the gifts in our life, and he's also the one who produces the fruit in our life. But there are some just uh, nuanced differences here. Uh, as we did the, per, uh, the uh, gifts last week, uh, the, they are plural, many, many gifts. Um, the fruit, on the other hand, are singular. It's not fruits. It's fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. I will talk about that a little more late in a little bit. And the gifts, uh, every believer has at least one of the gifts, but no believer has all of the gifts. Well, with the fruit, it is a, it is a package that uh, the Holy Spirit produces in our life. Uh, all of us are to have expressions of all of the fruit in our lives and demonstrate uh, that as we uh, live our lives, as we abide in Christ and are filled with the Holy Spirit. So uh, just some nuanced differences there. Um, sometimes people call love a gift, and that's true, it is, but it's uh, primarily a fruit, a fruit of the Spirit. We'll talk a little bit about that. A little bit more detail. The word fruit, like the word uh, word of God, actually, uh, there's a, about 10 different fruits, right? But we bunch them together like a bunch of grapes on a bunch, and Therefore, that's why we call it singular. Question, how do I use the fruit to love like God loves? And a follow-up question, what is the most important fruit? We've already just alluded to that. Um, <clears throat> as, we, as the uh, foundation and the atmosphere in which all this takes place, we remember that the triune God is a community of perfect love. So the, uh, the fruit of the Spirit starts way back in all of, et <laughs> all of eternity uh, because the triune God is a community of perfect love and uh, love is the fruit of the Spirit. And then Jesus prioritized love and his two great commandments. Uh, you remember those two commandments? One of them had to do with relationship with God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Uh, but then he added, Jesus added another commandment to that. You remember the second commandment? And the second commandment is horizontal. The first one was vertical with God. The second one is horizontal. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. Uh, Jesus said those two commandments sum up all of the law and all of the prophets. So this is a dynamic, uh, not just concept, reality that we're talking about. And then when Jesus was with his disciples in uh, for the three years, he walked with them and taught them and lived life with them. And then in the upper room, he, uh, he emphasized it again when he said, I give you a new commandment. The new commandment I give to you is that you will love one another. And then John, who was one of the primary apostles or disciples of Jesus, uh, he's pictured as the one who in the upper room was sitting next to Jesus and uh, kind of laying his head on Jesus' chest. Um, in his first letter, 1 John, he prioritizes love. Uh, love 
penetrates, permeates all of this uh, First John epistle. Uh, 24 times John mentions love, and two times he directly states God is love. And uh, then he draws the conclusion that if God is love, then we are to love him and love one another. And then not only John, but the Apostle Paul vividly describes love in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, uh, verses 4 through 7. Um, as we get to the fruit, one of the things I did recently was take this 1 Corinthians 13 passage and make it in one column and put the fruit of the Spirit in another column. And there is a huge correspondence between what Paul describes as love in 1 Corinthians 13 and what he also lists as the fruit of the, of the Spirit. I would, I would recommend that, that to you as well. It just solidifies, uh, for, for me at least, how important love is and the many various expressions of love. So you're asking us or giving us an assignment of taking Galatians 5 and comparing it to 1 Corinthians 13 and saying, look for the similarities of the definition of love and the definition of gifts or gift. Right. I did the old exercise of two columns mm -hmm. and then drawing lines, <laughs> drawing right. lines to the similarity, the ones that were uh, connected with each other. And most of them are in one way or another. Yeah, that's cool. Good idea. Finally. Finally, we, Paul says, are to be imitators of God. Uh, that's quite, that's quite something too, isn't it? To imitate God. Wow. How in the world do I do that? Well, Paul is, uh, gives the answer to that, that I, you, we as Christians are to live a life of love. Um, so that's how we get to a fruit. Um, all of the other fruits uh, ripen from love. Um, I see love as a, like a big canopy over all of the fruit of the spirit. In fact, love is the big canopy over all of our relationship with God. Um, and, uh, therefore love is the most important fruit. It's, in, it's interesting to me that in the Galatians five here, Paul doesn't use the plural. He uses the singular, uh, love is, is the first fruit that's mentioned but all of them are expressions in one way or another of love, the love of God that he has for us and produces this fruit in us that we can share with others. Do we have the ability to love ourselves? Oh, uh, I mean, not love our, yes, we, can, <laughs> we need the ability to love ourselves, but do we have the ability to love other people? Well, as we'll find out in a little bit, there are various kinds of love as we get into it. And uh, the love that is being talked about here is beyond our human ability to produce. Uh, it has to be uh, by the Spirit in our life. Only He can do that. In the purest sense, uh, the indwelling Spirit produces love. And then also the other Christian virtues in the life of the believer. And then uh, we also have a responsibility in this. We need to nurture uh, the growth of, uh, of love and the other virtues in our lives uh, it doesn't just happen because we click our uh, snap our fingers and uh, that so easily happens like you plug a plug into electric socket and all of a sudden you got it. No, it's more than that. It's a continual process. And how do we do this? Well, there's a thing called spiritual disciplines. I like to call them spiritual exercises that we do we engage in these because we want to continue to grow in our relationship with the Lord. I had uh, needed physical therapy several times and they gave me all the exercises and uh, I was to go and do them three times a week with a guide helping me and all that. And believe it or not, that really helped, really helped me. But then when I went home, they gave me that whole list of exercises and said, now Arden, uh, you continue to do these at home. And if I continue to do them, it worked. If I got lax about that, why well, then uh, the old stuff started coming back and having the same problems. So it's the same thing with these spiritual disciplines. They're exercises that if we do them, we will not only remain healthy spiritually, but we will grow spiritually as well. Think of it in terms of learning how to bat a ball. And if you have children at all, or as a child, your dad, maybe your mom, would put up 
um, would start throwing the ball underhanded to you. So you would try to catch it. And often it'd go right through your hands. And that would be very frustrating. You eventually get to the point where I realize if I cut my hands, I can get there and I can, I can pick it up and I, it won't drop. And then from there, it's a matter of batting it. And so you, you buy your kid this humongous big bat made out of plastic because of the chance of connecting is much better. And you get a big ball in like a wiffle ball and a wiffle bat, and you gently throw it in hopes that they might hit it. But when they first do, start doing it, they're facing you trying to hit the thing. So then you try to teach them, you got to hit it sideways and come through the, the and, and it takes a while to get it. Love is very similar to that. We understand love. We understand a ball. We understand a bat. But if you don't work at it, if you don't practice it, practice it at the level of a God type love, that agape love that loves regardless of what's happening around you. You love people anyway. And as a result of that, you continually do that. Your skill will get to a point where it just happens. And you can tell the people that really understand Christ-like love. Okay, you ready to uh, talk about each one of those fruits? Let's yes, see. I am. Okay, this is that picture again. And don't forget, take a picture of it. Let's hit it. Yep. So we'll talk about uh, each one of the fruit that's mentioned here. And uh, as we've said repeatedly today, love is the most important one, but it's a unique love. It's God's kind of love. Um, and you say, well, how does that um, differ from uh, love that families have for each other or friends have for each other? Well, it's a deeper kind of, of love. I'm privileged to be a part of a very loving family. And that love that we have as a family, frankly, grows out of God's love for each of us. But people who do not yet know Jesus as Savior can still be loving. They can be loving to people, loving to their friends, loving to their family. But uh, this love that is a fruit of the Spirit is, uh, is a higher quality of love than that. Or uh, physical attraction, certainly it's a higher quality than that. Um, it's a unique quality, this love. Uh, what is unique about it is that it's other-centered. It's self-giving. Uh, it's love in action. Um, greater love has no person than this, and he gives his life for his friends, Jesus said in the passage in John 15. So this is a radical, <laughs> this is loving radically, uh, not selfishly. When I was spent my years with Youth for Christ in ministry, we create an environment in which we make things very understanding. So we took this concept of agape and philos, and we put it into simple terms. And here they are. There's three different levels. I love you because that's that love where when somebody does something for you, then you turn around and say, okay, I appreciate that. Therefore, I love you. And then there's the, the, the I love you if, and that's one of those things that I love you if you accept me, if you're my friend. And then there's finally the, I love you anyhow. That's the ultimate love. That's the Christ-like love. And regardless of the circumstance, I accept you. I appreciate you. And even when you're ugly toward me, even when things are not going well in our relationship, I love you anyhow. Mm, that's a great way to express uh, these various kinds of love. It really is. Thanks, Dan. Mm -hmm. Then the fruit of the spirit is joy. Uh, sometimes people confuse joy and happiness, but there is a distinction between the two. Joy is more than happiness. How does that happen? Well, happiness is based on what the circumstances of our life may be. If uh, everything's going well, uh, I've got good health, there's money in the bank, and uh, I'm getting along well with my neighbors, all that kind of thing, uh, that, that, that can give us happiness, great happiness in our lives. Um, but joy is deeper than that. How, how is it deeper? Well, uh, joy is there even in the midst of uh, really adverse circumstances. It perseveres during them. It's resilient. It's not, it, 
<laughs> adverse circumstances don't kill this joy. It, uh, it sometimes even blooms in the midst of these. Um, in the Old Testament book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah and his people uh, had tremendous uh, circumstances, opposition against them as they tried to rebuild Jerusalem. Um, but they finally persevered in all of that. And they had a great festival and the reading of the law. And a part of that, Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Uh, in those adverse circumstances, for us as Christians in our life, all of us will face in one way or another some adverse circumstances in our lives. But the joy of the Lord will still be there. Uh, it's resilient. And this joy comes just by focusing on the Lord and keeping our lives open to him. Uh, I believe strongly in doing some daily devotions and reading the word and some devotional material. And much of this will uh, focus on, on joy. Even when we're in the wilderness experiences of our lives, the Lord is there with us and the joy of the Lord is our strength. And then another one that's listed is peace that Paul gives to us. And this peace is a profound sense of well-being. It's an inner serenity. It's something, again, that we cannot produce as human beings. It's produced by God in our lives. He is the God of all peace. The peace that he's talking about is, is much more than just uh, the absence of strife. It's not just signing a peace treaty like at the end of a war. That's a good thing to have. Uh, the strife is ended, but many times the cause of the strife is not dealt with in that situation, and it will rear its ugly head again. The peace that we're talking about, the peace of God that passes understanding, is uh, more than just the absence of strife. And then as we experience the peace of God, there's a transformation thing that's supposed, that will happen in our own heart, in our own lives and spirit, that Jesus said, be, be peacemakers. Well, how does that happen? Well, it happens as we ourselves experience the peace of the spirit and the spirit of Christ in our lives. And uh, we realize how important and function that is. And we want to see other people experience this peace in their lives. And so we become peacemakers and we work towards healing of uh, broken relationships. And uh, we're all broken in one way or another. And we need the peace of Christ and the spirit gives that to us. And then we want to share that with other people in a peacemaking uh, role, either in a friendship or and in any way we any way we can. Peace. God's peace. Uh, patience. <laughs> As Dan said, we might would like to take this off the list. Uh, patience is gentleness towards the failures of others. Uh, the, takes care of that critical spirit stuff. Uh, not being critical all the time. Um, <clears throat> we're slow to take uh, offense. In the First Corinthians passage uh, 13, uh, one of the <laughs> Paul starts it right out. Love is patience. Patient. It's slow to take offense. Uh, years ago, I had someone tell me that uh, he was speaking about pastors, especially. And since I was a pastor, he said, Arden, you need to learn how to toughen your skin without hardening your heart. Uh, that made a huge impression on me because once the heart, once the heart gets hard, uh, that's a very desperate situation. Um, when, when offense comes or people say, uh, mean and gruesome and sometimes even false things about us, uh, we need to just let that roll off. Like, uh, as they say, water off of a duck's back and keep our heart warm, guard our hearts. Proverb says, for it is the fountain of life. Don't become hard hearted. And this patient shines in a society where everyone is offended about something. Boy, that's the way it is now in our society, isn't it? Uh, we have to use the right terms for everybody so we don't offend them. Um, and uh, the list of that is getting so long that I can't begin to remember it, remember it all. Um, so we can be patient in the midst of all of this. And if somebody says something that offends us, they use the wrong pronoun for us or whatever, well, we can be patient. We can be gentle in the failures of others. That comes from the spirit. C 
kindness. Mm. Kindness goes a long way. My mother used to say to us, I had three siblings and we would sometimes fight. And uh, she would say, a soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up the anger. Anger, that's actually out of the book of Proverbs. I heard that many times from my mother. Um, and it's true. Just kindness goes a long, long way. It's the golden rule in action. It's treating others like we would want to be treated. Um, and it's, ta it's a tangible expression of, the, of love to another person, um, kindness. Uh, we can exemplify that on the road when we're driving. <laughs> we can exemplify that. Uh, the local Walmart where we live is often very, very crowded and uh, people get in the way or we in a hurry to get around them and they're just standing there in the aisle. Uh, kindness can go a long, long ways in uh, sharing the love of Christ. Goodness, goodness. Goodness is sharing the compassion of Christ in the lives of other people. Goodness is being expressed when we are genuinely concerned about others and meeting the needs of others. I'm really encouraged on the news today in the midst of the pandemic that when we see people uh, doing things uh, to help care for other people, uh, whether it's food or shelter or whatever it is, providing some funds so they can pay the rent for another week in their, or another month in their, in their residence, those kind of things, generosity and meeting the needs of others. Um, Desire to enhance the quality of lives of others. Um, we, we want to see the downtrodden lift, lifted up. And we do that as an expression of the goodness of God into their lives. So if I say to you, I'll pray for you. Is that good enough? Uh, certainly a vital first step, but uh, there should be some practical application to that. Uh, I will pray for you, but if we have uh, in, in any way, anywhere within our ability to help uh, remedy some of that, we should do that as well. Or we should have, gather together other people that can, can do that. Um, years ago in, in the church that I pastored, we had a group of men that uh, dedicated themselves to particularly helping, say, widows and so on. I know they put uh, roofs on several houses of uh, widows who just didn't have the wherewithal, the means uh, to uh, to repair, do the repairs in their in their uh, ho on their home. And so, to me, that was an expression of the goodness of God and the goodness of God through people and the love of God too, and the compassion of Christ too through all of that. Yeah, we can pray for them. Certainly we'll do that. But they still needed a roof over their heads. Yes. And sometimes prayer acted out is more effective than sitting back and praying and, and moving on. Put it, putting legs to our prayers. There you go. Yeah. Another one of the fruits mentioned here is faithfulness. Um, and we know God is faithful to us. And uh, we, are recall, we are to be faithful to him in response, but we are also to be faithful in our relationships with other people. Um, we are to demonstrate through our faithfulness that we are trustworthy and reliable. Uh, our word is our bond. Um, I come from a tradition uh, way, way back where they, they would not take oaths in court. And the reason they wouldn't was because they said, our word is our bond. We don't need to swear to anything, our word is our bond. A promise made is a promise kept. And they they live that in their lives. And it's good. That's faithfulness. And then think about this. How do people understand the faithfulness of God? Well, one of the ways, maybe very powerful ways, is if we did if they understand that we as followers of Christ, we are faithful, uh, that may be an arrow pointing them to to God. Um, 
our faithfulness to them. When we make them a promise about whatever it is, we will keep that promise. Um, and that demonstrates to them the faithfulness of God, too. So, Arden, you're bringing up the fact that back in the day, they, uh, and you know this must be firsthand, that your word was your bond. Mm -hmm. Was that during the uh, horse and buggy era? It, yeah, <laughs> it was, frankly. <laughs> it sure was, but that doesn't mean it's not good for us today as well. And and you were there firsthand. Is that what I'm hearing? No, I wasn't there firsthand. Oh. I've read the history. Okay. But, you know, you, you look at how litigious our society is today. Oh, my. Oh, everybody's suing everybody about everything, yeah. uh, big or small. Mm -hmm. And uh, faithfulness and relationships with each other uh, would, would not would go a long, long ways in reducing a lot of that. And then in First Corinthians, Paul said that uh, Christians should not go to court against Christians either. Mm -hmm. He uh, chastised them for that. Mm -hmm. um, they should be faithful in their relationships with each other. Then, uh, then suing is unnecessary. Yes. I love this word gentleness. Uh, I had the, I had the uh, wonderful experience of having a gentle father. He was a God loving people loving man, a farmer in Indiana, and I was the firstborn. And uh, my dad was was just always, always gentle. It doesn't mean he would let me get away with anything. Uh, in fact, one day he made me cut out my own paddle on the jigsaw. But, uh, jigsaw. <laughs> Did you make but it small? It, <laughs> it was quarter inch plywood that he made mm -hmm. it out of. Yes. Um, and to this day, he made me cut it out myself. But to this day, I can't remember that he spanked me with it. Uh, I think uh, the lesson was in uh, having to cut it out myself. Um, <clears throat> but all this to say, gentleness is strength under control. My dad was uh, a farmer. He was strong. and uh, But he never used that strength in a cruel way. Uh, the picture here, another picture here is like you have this big, powerful horse a stallion and uh it has wonderful power and strength but when you put a bit and bridle in it and it learns that the importance of the bit and the bridle you have you still have the strength but now the strength is under control um it's uh the people who are in the positions of power restraining their anger um and doing so out of the consideration for another person uh, you can see this sometimes in a judge who um, maybe the person indeed is guilty under the law and their degrees of uh, penalty that could be prescribed legally. But as he senses or she senses that uh, a little leniency here might go a long ways in uh, helping that person to get their lives turned around, they have the strength to do something very powerful, but oftentimes they will uh, choose a, lenient, a, a more lenient penalty and sentence uh, out of concern for that person and the, that person's circumstances. And we can confront issues so that it can be received as an expression of love, care, and commitment. Um, I believe this is very important too. Uh, we live in a society again, where at least politically, there's a lot of screaming at each other and uh, vilifying each other. But uh, in a gentle spirit, we'd like to see uh, that turned around. I also think about a, a wounded animal. If you try to care for a wounded animal, uh, because that animal is in so much pain, it will strike out at you. It will try to, it'll try to bite you if it's a wounded dog, for example. Um, but, and that's true of some people, people that are really wounded and we try to express love and care and commitment to them. Uh, their initial response may be suspicion. Their initial response may be striking back at us and all of that. Uh, in gentleness, we will persevere uh, through that, if at all possible. Gentleness is, is huge. Ah, we finally come to the end of the list. Yeah. And one of the hardest ones. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I don't think we really need to define this. I think everybody knows what it is. Uh, but self-control from a Christian perspective has a different nuance to it. Um, 
if we are under and since we are under the the, the presence of Christ in our life, it's uh, it's the Holy Spirit that's to be in control. Um, and so when we say self-control as a Christian, we really mean that uh, the, we want the Holy Spirit to be in charge in our life. We want the Holy Spirit to be the master of our life and uh, the one who actually not uh, transforms, transforms our desires and our passions. We have a new self. We have a new self in Christ. Um, I love Galatians 2.20. I'm crucified with Christ, Paul said. Nevertheless, I live. How? Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Uh, that means we have a completely new control center in our life, and it's not self. All the way back to session two, where we had the throne, a person on the throne of their lives. Who's, on the th who's in control? Is it self? in control or is it Christ who is in control of our lives? It doesn't eradicate the self, but self is in a surrendered relationship to Jesus Christ. So that to me is what self-control is as a fruit of the spirit. It's more than just gritting my teeth and saying, I will do what is right. Sometimes that's necessary for sure. But the motivation for that comes out of Christ being in control of our lives. It's a dynamic change. When Paul comes to the end of this list in Galatians chapter 5, he says there's a lot of other things that could be added here. There are things that uh, there's no law against, uh, is the way he put it. And uh, so the list that we have here in the fruit of the Spirit is a fantastic list, but it's not the uh, uh, an exhaustive list. <coughs> Excuse me. There are other things that could be added to it, and when we compare other writings of the scripture, uh, Paul, for example, uh, writes other lists of virtues when he's encouraging people to put off the old and to put off and put on the new. Uh, he'll re reiterate some of these things you know, that he here called the fruit of the spirit, but he'll also add other things to it. <clears throat> and in Second Peter, the first chapter, he says we become partakers of the divine nature. And then he has a whole list of things. Since, since that's true, add to this, add to this, add to this. What he's really saying is that new nature that we receive in Christ, let it, let it grow, let it bloom, let it, let it blossom. Um, nurture it, as we said, moment by moment, mindfully uh, in, our, in our lives. So um, this is a fruit of the Spirit is a great, great place to start. And uh, yet there may be others that uh, as we walk in the Spirit and live in the Spirit, that he'll bring to our attention that we need, we need to grow in as well. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting a frog in my throat. Um, in Jesus' words, now we've talked about this fruit of the Spirit uh, that Paul talks about, but uh, there's another fruit that's very, very important, and Jesus talked about it in uh, John 15 with his uh, disciples. I don't know if you noticed it when we were processing John 15, but Jesus said, I didn't choose you. I, uh, you, <laughs> excuse me, you didn't choose me. I chose you and I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. Um, it's, it's literally fruit that remains. It's the same word that Jesus used when he said, I remain in you, you remain in me. Now he wants the, us to produce that lasting fruit, a fruit that will last for eternity. What fruit is that? And then Jesus said, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. What is this fruit that remains, that remains for all of eternity? Um, <clears throat> obviously, love will remain for all of eternity. And there are a lot of people who have not yet experienced the love of Christ in their life. Uh, so I think this refers to our witness for Jesus and desiring to see other people to come into a deeply personal relationship with him. Uh, Dan, you've had a lot of experience in evangelism through your time with uh, Youth for Christ and in other ways as well. And uh, I know you have a heart for, for people to come to know Christ as Savior and Lord. 
um, you shared with me that you had come across some literature that was really, really helpful in this regard. And uh, we'd all benefit from you sharing that with us today. So there's this really neat book called God Space by Doug Pollock. And he used to be working for Campus Crusade for Christ with the basketball team that go throughout the world and represent Christ. And during halftime or at the evening session, Doug would present Christ to those people and asking them if they would like to become Christians. So he knows what he's talking about. But what's really ironic with him is he said this. He says, I am a recovering evangelist. He is interested in helping people become Christians, but he has found that pretty much the front door of trying to barge through the front door to present Christ is pretty much closed in our society now as a post-Christian society. Instead, he says, the back door is open. Well, how do you get through that back door? And his little booklet shares how to make that happen. I'd highly recommend it. It's in my top 10 books called God Space. And it's an easy read. And what's really cool is he uses some fantastic stories throughout it that makes it even more readable. So what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is share with you the practices he says that are very effective at getting to the point where you can share Christian ideas and realities with people without offending them. And one of the things that makes Christians scared to share their faith is they're afraid they might offend somebody else. So they will back off and they will not say much or they will use, excuse me, but they'll use the excuse of, well, my life represents that. Well, how many people have come to Christ because one's life represents it? We need to have words that help these people understand what the Bible says to be able to get them to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ so that they can be saved. So consider using a few of these, actually using all six of them. You start with a prayer and you ask God, how can I interact with people today that help them be able to see them as you are? So that's the first step in your prayer. Along with that prayer, what you say is, God, help me look at other people in their situations and understand where their pain is, understand what's going on in their life. Is the Holy Spirit working there at all? Is there something in their life that they need some encouragement, uh, need some caring, need some loving that I can do as a Christian? That brings you to the next point, which is serving. From noticing, there will be a chance where you can serve these people. Now, the first time I read the book, I go, oh, that one's not real important. I just want to get to the bottom line of being able to share Christ with people. Well, after reading it the second and third time, I found out that was an absolute critical piece of this thing. Because if you can do something for somebody, they then are much more open to listening to you and caring with you. And the end result is, is that God uses that because you are demonstrating God's love with no strings attached. Keep in mind, you're not serving to get to the point where you can be saying you're serving because you love this person and you want to care for that person where they're at, regardless of what they're thinking. Number four is listening. So what's the, one of the most important evangelistic tools that you have in your arsenal? <laughs> this one. And a lot of times we think, well, I got to get some Bible verses out there. I got to give my testimony. And that's a single direction going their way, which means you're not getting anything back to yourself to understand where they're coming from. And Christ, when you look at the representative of how he shared, he understood where people were coming from before he made statements. So listening, you focus on others, you ask to hear their story, and then you seek to understand it from their worldview. And it's like holding up a mirror, you reflect back to what you're hearing. So you can say to them, what I hear you saying is, or the way I'm understanding what you're saying is, and this helps confirm what they are thinking. They go, yeah, you got it. And so listening is one of the most important things other than the praying and noticing and the serving is that 
if you're not going to listen, you're probably not going to get to the point where you're going to be able to do the next two. Wondering, this one I absolutely really enjoy. It's an opportunity to ask questions. And this is going to promote the dialogue. Once you understand their, their story and their worldview, you're able to probe it with what's called wondering questions. And you can reflect on their life's journey together. You can probably identify with some of those things. You can tell a touch of your story with that process. Now, you're not getting straight to the bottom line right now and trying to ask them if they're saved. You're getting to the point of saying, I wonder, can you explain that a little bit more? Or I wonder why you have that kind of viewpoint. Or I wonder what in your background made, made you make that kind of a decision of where you're at. Wondering questions creates the environment for this next piece. And that is, when you are ready to share scripture or your testimony, you ask permission before you share. And so you've got this wondering question done, and you now see an opportunity that the Holy Spirit has opened up for you. And you say, I got something that's really neat that's happened in my life. Can I share that with you? That opens the door for them to say, yes. They can say no, the conversation shuts down or goes superficial. But at this point, very few people would ever say no. And then you can give them a bite-sized piece of a spiritual snack. He uses the, the idea of the spiritual snack here in that it's very easy for us to oversupply and therefore kill the demand. What that means is, is we'd like to talk about from Genesis to um, Revelation once we get the win the right to be heard with these people and we overfeed them. And as a result, they are not ready for any other step that you're going through. So keep it, keep it simple because then that, because you got this conversation going, there's going to be other opportunities to share a bit more as you go along. And eventually you'll be able to share how a person becomes a Christian or how a person through Christianity tackles a finance or a, a relationship issue in their life. And if you would like more on this, uh, email us and I'll send you more information on that. So in our minds, this is a key keeper slide. Sure is. Thanks, Dan, for sharing yep. that. So this is a summary. Once again, by now you have seen this enough that you've probably taken a picture or you're ready to ask us for it. I really so, like the really succinct statements on that. Uh, yeah, that, that has a lot of meaning. That's yeah. why it's a key keeper. <clears throat> right. All right. So here's a personal application of this thing. Whoops. Come on back. And that is reflect. Ask yourself, as you look at this list, which ones of these are you proficient at? Yeah, I do that one pretty good. Uh, this one, yeah, I, I'm good at that. <laughs> this one's kind of a little shaky. And so as you look at that list, you're saying, what am I good at? And then you flip that coin over and say, what can I improve? Now, there's probably a number that you can prove. Choose one and ask God, ask the Holy Spirit to help you during this coming next seven days to work on just that one. Get it in the front of your mind. Get it as a priority. Write it down. Put it on the refrigerator or on the window or uh, wherever else it's going to stay in your brain to say, okay, this is the fruit I'm working on this week. How can I improve it? And then apply that. Pardon? So how do I exhibit or show the fruit? Well, this word has come up time after time after time today, hasn't it? Love like God. Love other people. Be people-centered. And uh, even what Dan just shared with us about how to, how to share Christ with other people, uh, being people-centered and sensitive to them and how we do it. Be like Christ by living out the fruit as I minister to others. Uh, how, what would Jesus do <laughs> was a question that was being asked uh, several years ago. Um, and then continually grow in uh, your awareness, my awareness of the needs of people. And when we do all these things, it can get messy for sure. It's uh, not a not street that's uh, easily paved with no mess along the way, but because of the love of Christ in us, uh, why we will we will want to do that. 
So I encourage you to make some personal applications out of this um, in how you can love like God and like Christ and uh, become more sensitive to the needs of people. I need to bring us back and, and think of one other statement that's very important in this process. You do not have to go through all six of these things in order to get to the point of sharing Christ. The Holy Spirit can create an environment in which, bottom line, somebody needs Christ, you see it, and you just help them, and immediately you pray them through that. This is not a mandatory list. These are suggestions of practices that will open doors that are normally would not open up if you didn't use some of these. So please know that we are not saying that this is the only way to get it done. There is a number of ways out there. And um, feel free to choose to use these, but this one's pretty exciting. Want to talk about resources? Yes. Uh, earlier in uh, our time together, why I spoke about uh, spiritual disciplines and uh, spiritual exercises, and we have many resources that can help us. I. I have been benefited greatly from uh, the three that I'm going to mention to you here. The first one is by Donald Whitney, and he calls it Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. And uh, he explores 11 different Christian disciplines, but for all of them, the purpose is the purpose of godliness, that we would grow into the likeness of Christ. And he builds his uh, entire book around Paul's words to Timothy when he said, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Um, so why do we read the scripture? For the purpose of godliness. Why do we pray? For the purpose of godliness. Uh, why do we practice good stewardship? For the purpose of godliness. He does that with 14 uh, different uh, disciplines. So I would recommend this to you. It's a very easy read. Um, and uh, I've benefited, as I said, greatly from it. And then uh, another resource that has been very helpful is uh, by K Kenneth Boa, uh, Conformed to His Image. And uh, it's, he, he uh, goes through uh, spiritual formation and how it takes place in our life. I love the graphic on the, the picture on the, type, on the outside cover here of uh, a pot being formed. And uh, Christ is the, <clears throat> we are the clay, he's the potter. And uh, we put ourselves into the potter's hand and uh, do whatever we can so that uh, we can experience his formation in our lives. He, he uses the picture of a, a precious gem and how, how it all has various facets. They all have various facets to them. And he explores 12 different uh, facets of uh, spiritual formation. Um, I recommend this to you. Uh, sharing Christ with others is one of those things uh, that he mentions. And then a third resource, which I've discovered just in the last year, a spiritual disciplines handbook by uh, Adelaide Calhoun. Um, in this, this is not a sit down and read it through book. Uh, it is uh, explores 20 or 75 spiritual disciplines. And he, and she does it in a way that, um, share scripture, gets us immersed into it, uh, how we process all this in our lives. And uh, it's, uh, very, it's very, very worthwhile if uh, you're serious with uh, growing in, the, in your spiritual life. Uh, why do I point these to you now? Well, we've talked about the Holy, living in the Holy Spirit. And all of the teaching of scripture obviously is of utmost and primary importance to us. But uh, also, as we have said again, we are to be mindful moment by moment in our relationship with Christ, our relationship with the Holy Spirit, and growing in that. So uh, these we we can benefit greatly from putting some of these uh, tools into practice in our lives so that we're growing in Him. So today we said we would discover how to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Uh, did we accomplish that? And we also asked the question, what, what fruit can you grow into and grow about, about and above? You do a better job with. And we've also shared some resources uh, in addition to scripture 
uh, that can be of a great help to you in growing in your Christian life. So we are finally done, done. On YouTube, you will find three workshops. The first one is how to be more effective in your Bible study. The second one is how to be more effective with the um, prayer, your prayer life. The third one is this one, how to be more effective in allowing the Holy Spirit to work with and for you in your life. And the end result is, is you can find all these on YouTube by going to BFC Sebring. Now, another way to get a hold of this information, you'll see there in red, and it's Bible Basics at bfcsebring.org. You might want to write that down because if you want anything from us, this is the um, email address that you need to write to. So when it comes to us, only Pastor Arden and Pastor Andy and myself will see your communication. So if you would like us to pray for something or be concerned about something that's going on in your life, you can feel free to send that as, to us as well. And um, you ask who Pastor Andy is. He is the uh, uh, pastor at our church. And this goes to his inbox. Then he distributes it to Arden and myself. So thank you for your time with us. Wow. Uh, questions, write us comments. And as we close, Arden, would you take the honor of communicating with God? Yes, let's pray together. <clears throat> Lord, we've covered some uh, material to, in this, that uh, these four sessions that uh, are way, way beyond us. Uh, we indeed have been uh, exploring holy ground, and it is ground that uh, you invite us into, and it's, in, it's uh, ground that you lead us into and, uh, and direct us to grow deeper into it. Thank you for giving your, your son Jesus to us. Thank you for giving the Holy Spirit to us through Jesus. And uh, but thank you how this applies, not just in theoretical sense, but in a very practical way in our daily, daily lives and how we live and how, what our attitudes are and what our motivations are uh, so that you can work in our lives for the purpose of godliness and uh, us becoming more like more like Christ. Um, thank you for the way you and you alone can enrich our, our spiritual walk and our spiritual life. Uh, I thank you for Dan. I thank you for the opportunity to uh, serve with him uh, through these four sessions and for all of the help that he has given to me personally and to all of us as uh, we have shared in this experience together. Uh, may the glory and the honor go to you, our Savior and our Lord. To God be the glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.